Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the ways to tell that something is important is whether it gets repeated. For instance, as a child, you probably picked up on the fact that not talking to strangers and looking both ways before crossing the street were important because your parents undoubtedly repeated those things to you. They said, don't talk to strangers. Look both ways before crossing the street. At work, when a particular task is important, you can tell because your boss probably asks you about it. He probably offers encouragements to make sure that it gets accomplished on time. When there's an important event or anniversary coming up, your wife will probably mention it a few times to make sure that it's on your calendar and that you don't forget about it. It's a reality. When something is important, it tends to get repeated. And this reality, that things that are important tend to be repeated, that's not only true in our daily lives on this earth, that's also true in Scripture. In fact, in the part of God's Word that's before us this morning, that Gospel lesson from John chapter 20, Jesus does that very thing. He knows how we operate as people, and so he repeats himself in order to drive home to us a very important point. So what is this important truth that Jesus wants to drive home to us? Well, it's that simple statement that Jesus made three times in the span of this gospel lesson, peace be with you. This peace that Jesus speaks about, that he repeats in order to drive home to us, this peace is important because it's this peace that gives joy in the midst of fear. It's this peace that gives absolution in place of guilt, and it's this peace that gives assurance in the face of doubts. Now Jesus repeated that phrase, peace be with you, twice on the very first Easter morning, when, or the first Easter evening where part of our text happened. Last week we celebrated that joyful event of the resurrection and we reminded ourselves that, that even though the day of resurrection is a joyful one for us, for those first women who went to the tomb, it wasn't initially joyful. And it also wasn't initially very joyful for those disciples, even after the women came back from the tomb. The Gospel writer John tells us that on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. The disciples were afraid. And it's not too hard to figure out why they were afraid. They were afraid because of the Jews. Those Jewish leaders, you see, had placed a guard at Jesus' tomb. That guard was put there in order to make sure that the disciples didn't go and steal Jesus' body. The disciples didn't do anything like that, and yet Jesus' body was now gone. Despite the fact that the soldiers had seen Jesus rise with their own eyes, a little bit of bribery had convinced them to spread the lie that Jesus' disciples had actually come and taken the body away, that Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. Those disciples likely were afraid that maybe the Jewish leaders would use the lies of those soldiers as a pretext to arrest them, and even worse, maybe to kill them. But then, as those disciples were huddled together in that locked room for fear of the Jews, it was then that Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. In the midst of that fear felt by those disciples, Jesus came and he announced peace to them. And the peace that Jesus announced with his presence was a peace that changed things for those disciples. To be sure, it didn't change the source of their fear. The Jews were just as much a source of opposition and, and trouble for those disciples after Jesus appeared as before he had appeared. But what had changed was how those disciples could face that fear. 
They could face it with joy and confidence. They could face it with the peace of knowing that their Savior was alive and was there with them. And in fact, those disciples faced that fear with that peace and that joy. We don't get to hear about it in our text, But if you'd go on to pick up the book of Acts and you'd read about what the disciples did after Jesus rose and ascended into heaven, you would quickly find that those disciples preached the good news of forgiveness and eternal life. And as they did that, they were arrested and persecuted by the Jewish leaders. And yet even as they were arrested and persecuted, they rejoiced. They were joyful even in the midst of their fear because Jesus was with them. Christians today don't tend to gather behind locked doors out of fear of the Jews. However, there are still plenty of fears that Christians struggle with in the world today. In fact, just last Sunday with the bombings that happened of some Christian churches in Sri Lanka, we were reminded that there are believers in some places who have to fear to do the very thing that you and I are doing this morning, gathering to hear God's word. And while that particular fear may not be first and foremost on our minds here in the United States, there are plenty of other fears that probably rise in our minds as we go throughout our lives. Perhaps at times you are afraid about your health or maybe about your job. And truth be told, I probably can't even list this morning all of the things that you might be afraid of just this coming week. But your Savior Jesus says to you what he said to those disciples on that first Easter evening. Peace be with you. After all, isn't that what your Savior says through his called servant at the end of every church service? The last words of the liturgy are these. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. And Jesus says that to you right before you go out into the world, right before you go out to face all of those things that might cause you to be afraid. Jesus gives you his peace that peace of his presence with you. And that peace, it changes things, doesn't it? It doesn't remove the fears of this life, but it makes a difference in the way that you face those fears in this life. You face them knowing that the Lord Jesus, who has risen from death and is now the Lord of life and death, is with you. That fact that Jesus is with you gives you peace as you face the fears of this life, the peace of knowing that the ruler of heaven and earth is at your side, and that peace makes all the difference as you go through this life, doesn't it? But Jesus didn't just announce peace be with you in order to give those disciples joy in the midst of their fears. No, Jesus actually repeated that almost immediately on that first Easter evening. John tells us, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The second time that Jesus announces, peace be with you, he does it to address the problem of guilt. Those disciples, they were carrying a load of guilt with them. They were carrying with them the guilt of having abandoned Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were carrying with them the guilt of not believing the many times Jesus had told them in advance that he would not only die but rise again. By announcing that peace to his disciples a second time and by going on to commission them to preach the message of forgiveness, Jesus was absolving them of their guilt. He was washing that guilt away. That's what it means to absolve after all. It means to to wash something away. Jesus washed away their guilt completely. I would imagine that... You guys are are familiar with the phrase, 
there's no rest for the wicked. That's actually a biblical thought. In fact, the exact words from the book of Isaiah are these, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And that's entirely true. There is no peace, there is no rest for those who have a wicked and evil conscience. And that's not just simply something that that smart people throughout history have noticed. I mean, certainly you could point to great works of literature like Shakespeare's Macbeth or Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment that explore the inescapability of guilt, that it just plagues people. That truth is, is real because God has said it. And you don't need to look into the great works of literature for evidence of its truth. All you have to do is look into your own heart. Because I would imagine that like those disciples, you too at times have carried a burden of guilt in your heart. Guilt from some failure, some wrong that you've done. Jesus offers the same peace that he gave to those disciples, the peace that absolves and washes away guilt. And that's because what Jesus commanded those disciples to do still goes on today. Jesus still offers that peace that that gives absolution from guilt. That's why I stand up and every Sunday publicly announce as well as privately speak to those who come to me the words, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those words are as valid and certain as if Jesus Christ himself were speaking them to you because they are Jesus' words. They are his words that give you the peace of absolution in place of your guilty hearts. In addition to those first two times that Jesus said, peace be with you to those disciples on Easter Sunday, one time to give them joy in the midst of fear and a second time to give them absolution in place of their guilt, Jesus said it a third time in our text, but that third time wasn't actually on the first Easter evening. It was a week week later. And John explains to us the background for that second appearance of Jesus. He tells us, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. One of Jesus' disciples, Thomas, was not there that first Easter. And when he heard that Jesus was alive, he had his doubts. He wasn't entirely sure. He wanted proof. Almost as if in in response to that demand for proof, John tells us that eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here Jesus announced his peace for yet another reason. Jesus announced his peace in order to give assurance to Thomas in the face of his doubts. And what's interesting is that John does not record Thomas actually touching those nail prints in Jesus' hand or that scar from the spear in Jesus' side. It's likely that Thomas did touch them. However, from what John tells us, It was Jesus' words of peace that led him to announce, my Lord and my God. It was that peace that Jesus announced that gave Thomas that kind of assurance to confess that about Jesus. You and I, we too at times have our doubts 
Oh, probably not on Easter morning, maybe not even on the Sunday after Easter. We probably don't have doubts then that Jesus is alive and that, that we have the blessings of that resurrection. But oftentimes it's as we go about just the routine of daily life on this earth that doubts can creep up into our minds. It's when you see the evil and the injustice that goes on each day in this world that maybe the doubt creeps into your mind, is Jesus really in control of this world? It's when you look in the mirror and you see those reminders of the aging process that maybe the doubt rises in your mind, what really is going to happen when I die? Or maybe it's not anything as big as that, the evil in this world or the prospect of death. Maybe it's just when you think about the the day-to-day needs of life, that doubts rise in your mind of how are those needs going to be met? Your Savior Jesus says to you what he said to Thomas, peace be with you. After all, what is it that, that I say immediately after the words of institution in the Lord's Supper? I say, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And in that supper, peace is exactly what Jesus gives us. Peace in the face of our fears in this life. It's in that supper where Jesus gives us the peace that offers assurance in the face of the evils and injustices of this life. After all, in that supper, We are reminded of the death of Jesus, the one who suffered the greatest evils and the greatest injustice and yet was still in control. And so he too is in control in the midst of the injustices and evils of this life to work good. It's there in that supper where Jesus gives peace. There he offers the the assurance in the face of our own aging and the reality of death, that this Savior will raise us to eternal life, that he will bring us to that heavenly feast where we will live with him forever. It's in that supper where Jesus gives us the peace that offers assurance in the face of the the daily worries about our needs, that a God who has loved us so much to richly provide for our spiritual needs how could he possibly forget to take care of our bodies as well? And so we see there in that supper, the Savior does offer us that same peace that assures us in the face of our worries and our doubts. When something is important, it tends to get repeated. And certainly that's what Jesus does here. Because of how important it is for us to have peace, he repeats again and again for us, peace be with you. He does that to drive that peace into our hearts so that we would realize that through this peace, God gives us joy in the midst of fear, absolution in place of guilt, and assurance in the face of doubts. May God grant that we would truly treasure that peace for the great gift that it is. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.